Uh, I think I've got, yeah, I think it's got, got it. Okay. Um, should we get moving? Are we good to, so I'm, I hope everybody can hear us. Um, my name's George Wittemeyer. It's not Miriam Hernandez, although I like that name. Um, I am a professor at Colorado State University and I have the honor of hosting uh, this session today. And um, most notably, I get to introduce our keynote uh, speaker of the day, who's Matthew Luskin, who I think you guys can all see, or I'm not sure I can see. Um, hopefully everybody can see. Um, and uh, Matthew's been working on a really critical topic. He's going to speak to us today about Afghan swine fever. I think we all know uh, the story of Afghan swine fever, um, you know, noted for, for having uh, one of the most substantial impacts on uh, Chinese uh, gross domestic product in 2019 as it swept through and had mass, caused massive disruption in the uh, pork industry and, and general protein availability uh, in general in China, which cascaded globally, um, influencing costs in Europe and, and um, really across the world. It's been implicated in having impacts on um, beef production in South America, which has repercussions on uh, tropical forest conditions. So, so a serious major issue. A lot of um, European countries are dealing with ASF now um, and, and the fear of, of what it's going to do to their industries. And, and we um, here in the US, where I'm based, we're also terrified of ASF. And there's a lot of efforts going in to try to diagnose what, how we might contain it if it gets over here. Um, it's going to be a tough job. Um, and I think in, in all this sort of uh, melee around uh, African swine fever and, the, and, and uh, uh, protein impacts, gross domestic product impacts, we often overlook the impacts on other native sewage. And um, I was lucky enough to be the editor on a paper that um, Dr. Liskin uh, led and uh, recently got published in Conservation Letters that talked explicitly about, um, Lars, I'm going to mute you, that, that talked explicitly about uh, the potential impacts of ASF on uh, native sewage across uh, Southeast Asia. And so I think it's really important work. I'm really excited to hear more about it today. And um, I wanted to hand off uh, to Matthew now. I, I guess my introduction wasn't as detailed about you, but Matthew, um, uh, do you want to, to sort of detail your, your current position? And <laughs> I handled the topic more than you. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm excited to hand over to Matthew and looking forward to this session. Great. Thank you, George. Um, let me share my screen right now. And then I go to my presentation. So I have a few things open. And then I full screen that. And can you guys see the first slide, George? Yep, got it. Right. Okay. So uh, yeah, my name is Matthew. I'm a lecturer at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. For those who aren't in Australia, a lecturer is actually like a tenure track research position. And my, my research position here is like 80% research. And I focus mostly on Southeast Asian rainforest, the focus on uh, large wildlife species. And uh, my lab is called the Ecological Cascades Lab. And the website for us is ecologicalcascades.com. And we put on a lot of our um, ideas and new work on that site. And we have a bunch of just general ecology. So if you want to know anything more about the lab or are interested, if there's PhD students here that might want to work on Southeast Asia wildlife or uh, plant animal interactions, that would be the place to go and learn more. But because I'm very interested in this topic, and I'll talk a little bit about some of my other work. Um, anyway, in the talk, I'll just jump right in. Oh, I will just give you a quick. So I did my PhD at Berkeley. Um, that's actually where I ran into George first. And then I did a postdoc with the Smithsonian Institute, but I was based in Singapore. And um, I sampled the large wildlife communities at all the forest geo tree plots. So I think everyone will probably know that there's these um, huge forest inventories, 50 hectares around the world 
they've repeated this uh, many different times. Part of the Smithsonian's huge, uh, used to be called the CTFS network, and now it's called the Forest Geo Network, to really quantify forest structure and diversity around the world. And so my role for my postdoc was to add in a layer for wildlife. And we're still working on uh, how to link up those data sets. And so now at um, in Australia, my focus has kind of shifted toward wildlife conservation. That's um, been what I've mostly focused on, which is what we're gonna talk about today. So will the onslaught of African swine fever cause Asian pig extinctions and trophic cascades? When I say trophic cascades, I use that generally. What I really mean is an ecological cascade. We're not losing our apex predator, which is how a trophic cascade is normally defined, but trophic cascade sounds better. So um, I really need to acknowledge my co-authors that are listed here. Um, they, they drove this, it was their idea, and they just kind of brought me in because I think about pigs in Asia so much, and so I was the right person maybe to lead it. Um, but this work really was uh, a group effort. Um, so thanks to them. All right, so what we have here is an unsuspecting pig species that's been isolated on a little Indonesian island for a million years. It has no um, resistance to almost any of the known pig viruses. It is a sitting duck. And we have African swine fever that's been spreading rampantly throughout Asia over the last uh, year and a half. And uh, things are not looking good. And if you think about uh, what these different waves represent, we had 2020, the virus made it all the way down into Indonesia where most of these pigs are found. It made it throughout um, many parts of the Philippines where the other half of these endemic pigs are found. And then we have uh, this year, which um, a lot of us are extremely worried about what's gonna happen in the, in the next 10 months. And the future is at this point, uh, not pretty. And so this story is what we summarized in this paper that George was referring to. Um, that just came out last month um, in Conservation Letters. So if you want to know basically everything I talk about today will be in that paper in some way or another, and all the citations are in there too. So I'm going to focus this paper without citations and just make it a more, hopefully, easy to listen to uh, version of the story. So what is African swine fever? It's a DNA virus endemic to Africa. It replicates predominantly in the cytoplasm, and it's a very unique virus. It's not like any of the other viruses that you might have heard of, like swine flu, it's not anything related to that. That's a virus that can transmit to humans. It's not classical swine fever, even though they have a similar name. It's utterly separate from that. Okay, it's endemic to Africa, but it does not cause mortality in the species where it has evolved with. Um, so free living warthogs that were tested in Africa, 80% of them tested positive for the virus, but, did, but were living their lives just fine. Um, within the Suidae family, all animals are all species are um, predicted to be susceptible. There's not a species that hasn't been susceptible yet, but at this point, peccaries are not susceptible and there's no, so peccaries are the next closest related family. So the symptoms are fever and external and internal hemorrhaging and then death. And so if we think about what does this actually do to a pig, um, the symptoms are similar to what you might expect for Ebola in humans. So this is really the, the Ebola for pigs. So these are the native uh, host species, warhogs, bush pigs, giant forest hog, red river hog. And this is what an infected uh, um, domestic pig looks like when it has African swine fever, it's covered in hemorrhaging and then dies. So transmission, this virus is just, it's even worse than COVID because it can live on, so it can be transmitted any way you can think of virus can be transmitted. Through direct contact, through fomites on added objects, through indirectly through vectors like ticks. <clears throat> it can also be, um, be active in meat for three to six months after the animal has been dead. It can resist hot and cold temperatures in frozen and cured and cooked meat. And it can live over a hundred days. So that means you can have a pig that didn't show any symptoms and was slaughtered right away. So before they knew there was African swine fever outbreak, that pig's made into a sausage. That sausage is shipped from China down to Indonesia. And someone in Bali at a nice restaurant takes a bite of that pork uh, sausage. Mm, that's delicious. They don't eat it all. It goes in the trash. Trash gets put out um, in a where, area where it's not being, uh, you know, it's not disposed of correctly. It's just in a trash heap in the back, potentially. Or someone brings it home to feed to their domestic pigs, of which there's a lot in Bali. Boom, that virus has now spread to Bali. 
So this virus is very well adapted to doing what it does best, which is spreading. Another thing that makes it difficult is the way that pigs um, forage themselves. They're scavengers. They are mesopredators, so they'll actually eat small animals, but they love eating carrion. And so they'll also eat um, the carcasses that are infected. So if a dead pig in, um, is found out, out in the wild, it can infect many other pig species because the others will come just to scavenge on it. And then also it's um, animal feed contains pork products, waste pork products a lot. So then you get infection among pig farms. So uh, pigs are the number one meat eaten globally. And this uh, data is a little bit out of date, um, but as China in particular has increased their pork production and consumption, uh, pigs are, uh, pig meat, pork is the number one food or meat consumed globally. And as a result, you have tons of trade in pork, which means the spread of African swine fever is very likely. And that's exactly what we see. So the red shows where African swine fever is currently active in 2021 today from um, the FAO. And uh, it, it's very difficult to eradicate. So it's been persistent in Eastern Europe and Russia now for over 50, for about 15 years. There was outbreaks in the Iberian Peninsula that lasted from 1960 to 1990s. There was outbreaks from the trash, uh, the waste products from planes that used to that would fly in from to the Caribbean. So those waste products that contain contain pork were then discarded outside the um, airports, and it, the disease spread into the Caribbean and then into Central and South America in the 60s. Um, so this virus is very widespread. The problem is in Asia, 75% of the world's pig species are found here and they have smaller populations, smaller ranges, and are thus more susceptible. So the current outbreak, it started in 2018. And um, as a result of its uh, very quick spread throughout um, China, over 200 million pigs were culled. So that number sounds big, but if you try to just get your head around it, it's astronomical. And this number is outdated, 200 million pigs. And that cost over 200 billion US dollar equivalent, over a trillion yuan. And sadly, it also led to just an unconscionable waste of sentient life and lots of reports of inhumane culling. So, um, you know, it just takes time, effort, and money to euthanize an animal. And so a lot of these pig farms would go straight to the disposal process. So it started in China, and then within a year, it spread to almost every single other Southeast Asian country. Um, it's also been detected in different um, wild boar, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more also. So these, these reports here are for deaths, not choline, from, um, from African swine fever and in domestic pigs only. And the blue dots show uh, 2020 confirmed uh, African swine fever in wild pigs. And so there's no significant signs of this virus stopping. So that's very concerning. So this map um, that we created shows the distribution of different pig species. And I want to highlight how small those distributions are in a lot of these little islands and overlays that with the outbreaks of African swine fever. And um, these blue lines represent uh, shipping lanes. And so what that just highlights is that there are tons, wherever there's someone, whatever there's a person on a ship, there's probably a pork product of some sort that they're carrying with them. And even if that pork product, they don't finish it, it just goes into the trash, then they're gonna dispose of it somewhere. And so all these blue lines just represent tons of opportunities for African swine fever to spread to all these regions where we have endemic pigs. Um, it's interesting to note that in Indonesia, um, the pig spread has been limited uh, initially to North Sumatra and Bali, which are Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world. And um, they have a halal diet, so they generally don't consume pork products. But there are huge populations of Chinese people and non-Muslim um, ethnic groups. So in, in North Sumatra, it's the Batak um, Dayak people. So they're, they um, actively consume pork and wild pigs. And in Bali, it's Hindu. They're Hindu, so they um, have a very strong culture of eating pigs. And that's where we first identified uh, disease as well. So 
um, in Southeast Asia, we have six of the eight species of Seuss, uh, including a bunch of endemic warty pigs, which is um, a group of within the genus Seuss. We have all four of the Bobby Rusa genus, and we have the um, pygmy hogs in um, India, which is right here. No, sorry, over here. Oh, there it is. Sorry, I missed up. Um, so uh, Southeast Asia is truly the, the epicenter of pig diversity in the world. So um, there's lots of opportunities for domestic pigs to transmit the virus to wild pigs and for wild pigs to contract it anyway. And um, a lot of the, uh, there's no sign that these species that we have in Southeast Asia would be immune to African swine fever. So a big issue is backyard pig production. So what this means is just um, kind of rural pig production that's not in a big industrial farm. <laughs> pigs can easily um, move, wild pigs can move into the farms and so they can contract the disease by interacting with these backyard pig farms in a number of different ways. And so this is a common sites in, in Southeast Asia where you'll see just, just some pigs going down the road or in the backyard and so wild pigs are in these same areas and they'll come in and, and engage with these domestic pigs or at least overlap in ways that would definitely facilitate the disease spreading. So in um, uh, this brand new rapid communication paper that came out, um, they only tested a few carcasses. So these are dead pigs they found in the wild. And in Laos, four or five carcasses contained African swine fever. And in Vietnam, two of three carcasses contained uh, African swine fever. So this is, again, is just brand new data that we have. Very few people are monitoring dead pigs, testing dead pigs for the virus, but it looks like this disease is out in the wild populations already. Um, and again, oh, so now let's meet these different pigs that we're worried about. We need to, we need to care about them because um, they are charismatic in their, in their pig way. And so I think if you see photos of them, you'll actually care more about conserving these species. And um, so we'll start with the Tongan Bobby Rusa. So this species is only found on um, this one little island in Indonesia. You can barely even see it on that map. And so uh, I'm just gonna fly through the different species here. So then we have the Sulawesi Bobby Rusa. We have the um, Hairy Bobby Rusa. We have the Sumatran bearded pigs. So this is um, a traffic jam after a um, in an area where they're migrating in Kerinci Sebla. And so um, I took this photo right off of right outside of an oil palm plantation where these animals were uh, moving through in large numbers and then crop rating. Um, so uh, bearded pigs are really interesting for a number of reasons. They're actually one of the animals I'm most interested in. But a big reason is because they migrate huge distances. Um, in Borneo, they cross the entire island to track these mast fruiting resources that move throughout the island um, through time. And so we don't want to lose those ecological processes. So the Palawan bearded pig, um, so this one, one of my co-authors, Eric Majard, will call the, these pigs the hipsters of the jungle. And that's because they have cool mustaches and a mohawk. They're very stylish. We have the um, different warty pigs. So this one's critically endangered. These ones are vulnerable. Um, these ones are from, those ones were from the Philippines. This one's in um, Java. And so usually warty pigs actually aren't that warty, but the Javan warty pig is definitely warty. Um, Sulawesi warty pig. There's a new subspecies that is uh, of pig that has actually just been given its own name, which is a dwarf relative of Javan warty pig on the Bawain Island in Indonesia. And there's only 230 individuals. And this is the best photo of the animal I could even find. And then finally, the cutest of the of the um, Asian pigs, the 10 inch tall pygmy hog. They were thought to be extinct. And then there was, um, they rediscovered, there was a captive feeding program. There's only 300 animals, 80 of them are in a, in a captive breeding currently. And they were very susceptible to classical wine, swine fever. And here you can see on the map, these little tiny dots is the only places where they live. And sadly, African swine fever is already in this region. So it's a very big priority. Mm -hmm. Um, here's some more adorable pictures. Uh, there is also some news about this in the region. So um, 
this has not gone completely um, undetected. There are people are concerned about this, but the um, protocols, which we'll talk about later, about how do we conserve these animals in the face of African swine fever, uh, have not been well established. Okay, so African swine fever is not just um, going to affect pig species conservation and the pork industry, it also affects humans. So it significantly reduces people's incomes, their calorie intake and protein. And so um, the loss of pork uh, due to African swine fever in China was estimated to reduce the total calories available to China by 1.5% in 2020. So that's a pretty crazy um, number to me. And so uh, that just gives you a, an idea of the scale of this issue. So what that means is people care about their pigs and they don't want to just kill them and throw them away because they're going to lose a bunch of money. And so there's actually protests against calling in North Sumatra. Oops, there should be, oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. Um, in, in, beer, in, um, in other areas of uh, Southeast Asia, pigs play a really important role in the culture. And this is especially true in Borneo where pig hunting is just ingrained in the in the different Dayak communities cultures and is a very important food source for people in the island, especially in the rural areas. So South Korea is a really sad example. Sorry, North Korea is a really sad example because unconfirmed reports, of course, very little comes out of North Korea in the, in the media, but um, unconfirmed reports say African swine fever is out of control there. And this could really contribute to the humanitarian crisis. Um, you know, there's been uh, reports of South Korea trying to prevent the spread of the disease using snipers and even thermal imaging drones to find these animals crossing the border from North Korea and taking them out. And this image of people in South Korea is, just shows that they're taking the virus very seriously, not unlike their um, the way that they handled COVID-19, South Korea seems to be very on top of uh, handling epidemics. So what do we do to conserve species? Well, first we have the bunker solution. And this is literally, we need to take some animals and get them in captivity with high biosecurity and have an active breeding program before the virus gets there. So this needs to be done immediately. And I think a lot of opportunities already exist because there are zoos that have many of these species in their collections. Um, and then at those zoos or captive breeding programs, we need to have very um, strong biosecurity measures because we wouldn't want someone inadvertently, a, um, you know, a, a handler coming in with the virus in a sandwich or any other way. Um, second most important thing we need to do is um, make sure that pigs that have been identified as having the virus or even from farms where the virus is spreading um, are disposed of correctly. So this means burying at least two meters under water or and or burning them and definitely not disposing of carcasses in the river, which is commonly done. So in the classical swine fever outbreak from a few years ago in Indonesia, they just dumped thousands of pigs into rivers and those pigs as they float down, they're going to be scavenged on by all the wild pigs. And that's a really easy transmission vector. And so instead now what we need to do is having these, um, having them buried. And then more generally, and this is something that's very, you know, hard to actually implement, but just proper waste disposal where food waste is not going into the backyard pig farms, which is normally would be a great solution for uh, making better use of food waste. But at this point in time, it's just, especially in areas that have endemic pigs, it's just not worth it. So restricting trade in pigs and pork from African swine fever regions. So this is especially true for, for islands that have endemic pig species. There should be extremely tight restrictions on um, trade right now. And then we need to establish testing and monitoring programs for um, domestic pigs and pork products. There really needs to be an open access online monitoring and reporting system. This already exists for African swine fever in Europe. And um, there needs to be strict biosecurity measures for researchers and monitoring team because the same people that are testing for African swine fever could be the people who are then going to transmit it to um, native pigs when they go home. And then implementing contact tracing. These things are the same ideas that we might um, apply to COVID, but 
obviously it's a much different context when you're in rural areas of Indonesia and talking about a pig disease and not a um, and not a human disease. So there's a huge uh, um, opportunity for interesting research to strongly contribute to conservation. So we have no idea right now about mortality and transmiss transmission rates in wild Suscrofa or other pig species, or we don't have um, modeling studies yet on how the virus could spread and what it could do to populations. And especially considering that pigs have very complicated social structures and movement patterns. Another important um, avenue is that there needs, is public outreach and education. And this is to both prevent people from um, protesting the choline, which is right now our only effective measure at, at controlling the virus, because we don't have a vaccine at this point, and also public support for monitoring programs. And then building local capacity. So uh, there needs to be labs, local labs, where um, rapid testing of different products and uh, live pigs and pork products can be done. And there needs to be um, intersectoral collaborations between governments, researchers, and the farmers, so that we don't have, you know, a lot of the um, mis misinformation and distrust that we've already observed with the COVID outbreak. That same thing could be um, could become a big issue for African swine fever. All right, so now let's uh, talk about um, a potential positive, which is that there are active vaccine um, uh, developments. In fact, I think one of the people who are is developing. The vaccine is on this call right now. Um, and so there's a gene deletion approach that the USDA was using, and that has been um, that has been licensed for uh, trials. And there was a trial reported from Vietnam that reported very good success. And then there's the adenovirus approach, and this was um, developed and trialed in England. And um, there, at this point, I have not read of any licensing of that, but the trial seemed to be successful. So great, we have a vaccine. Is this gonna mean that now we can have a breath, we can take a breath and not worry so much about conservation of Asian pigs? Absolutely not, because it's totally not practical to be vaccinating um, large amounts of Asian pigs. That vaccine is not gonna be available in a, wide, a widespread within the one to two year period that we're most worried about the onslaught of African swine fever hitting Southeast Asia. And so um, at this point, uh, this vaccine is great news for the future, but it will not address this immediate conservation threat that we are facing. It's a very active space. So these are just um, some recent news articles and you can stay up to date on this uh, on Google. Okay, so now let's talk about what are the other cascading impacts of African swine fever besides the impacts on human livelihoods. So pigs are the most common dominant animal in Southeast Asian forest. So what this, um, these points are showing on this map are places where um, we've put together camera trap data, either from public sources or my own camera trapping. And what we find is in over 90% of the forest we sample, pigs are the most common. Looks like we've got an internet glitch right now. Let's check on with them via email. Hopefully you'll jump back on. Well, we're going to have a short break while we try to get Matthew back on. And then um, 
we'll open this up to questions once we get them back. While we're having this break, I just wanted to mention that on February 24th, uh, at 1700 GMT, Michael Evans of Defenders of Wildlife will be um, giving the next uh, seminar and that's gonna be on supporting habitat conservation with automated change detection in Google Earth Engine. So just to flag that to you, oh, it looks like Matthew's back up. Hold on. Hey, George. Hey, got you. I think you just dropped off. Um, all right, let's hop right back in. I don't know if that was, there's a storm outside. I wouldn't think that would affect the internet. I have no idea. And that, I am, I'm guessing that was me, right? I think it was you, yeah. That's honestly, it's never happened in, in 10 months of working here. I'm so sorry to everyone. So now we got the presentation, we'll hop right back in. We were on the cascading impacts, the previous slide, I think when it clicked off. This one? Yep. Great. So we have we have compiled camera trap data from around the region, um, uh, over 90, 92 sites, 211 surveys, and over 90% of these places, pigs are the number one animal at that place. And especially if you multiply that out for the biomass of wildlife at these regions, at these places, at these forests, they are for sure the number one, um, uh, they constitute the most biomass. So then what we did is we looked at whether or not um, pigs are going to be increasing or decreasing because with forest degradation, which is rampant throughout the region. And so what we did is we categorized these different forests uh, based on their, um, well, we didn't. There was a um, group here at University of Queensland that categorized all forests globally based on their integrity, which incorporates whether or not they were logged, whether or not they were fragmented, whether or not it was an edge. And so they made these maps that allow you to um, get a picture of the overall forest degradation. And pigs are turned out to be more common, significantly more common in degraded areas. And if we extrapolate that, what that means is pigs are going to be increasing throughout time. Wait, can you, sorry, can you guys see my, all this stuff too on my screen? Here. We yes. can see, what we can see, I think so. What, what are you asking about? I was asking if the um, picture in picture was there anyway. Yeah, the sorry. picture, the, the forest conditions, that's up. Yeah. Okay. So what this, so just to summarize that slide, pigs are increasing with forest degradation, which is rampant through Southeast Asia. So not only are they the most important, the most important numerically and by biomass, they're probably also increasing. So they're just, they represent a very important part of this ecosystem. So also connecting wild pigs to uh, people, we found that wild pigs were the number one source of crop damage in Sumatra. And then we also found that wild pigs have um, interactions with farming that actually lead their populations to balloon. And then this has negative impacts on the forest ecology. And I'm gonna take two seconds to walk you through that because it's a pretty cool um, little situation. So at, this study was done at one site that's very characteristic of many places in Southeast Asia, where you have oil palm right next to um, a forest. And this was a, a protected, primary rainforest. And so pigs move in at night and cooperate on oil palm. And this is, pigs are cooperating throughout the region. Oil palm is present throughout the region. And when they go back into the forest during the day to be safe, they're also uh, consuming seeds there and they're making nests. And these birthing nests are a very interesting um, disturbance that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. So they rip out literally two to 300 small seedlings and saplings and they pile them up and they give birth underneath that. Um, and so if you can imagine there's uh, very large densities of pigs ripping out two or 300 saplings uh, every year because pigs reproduce at least once, oftentimes twice per year, that can have a major effect on the forest. And that's what we found. So what this graph is showing is the amount of wild boar in the forest that we were studying over a long period of time, which we measured by counting their nests. What we found is we found a um, hundredfold increase, hundredfold decline and then increase uh, over this 20 year study period. And this corresponded perfectly with the amount of oil palm available in the plantations next door. And what this highlights is that these populations of pigs in the region are strongly now linked to the abundances of uh, farmland food sources. And then what we did is we do some exclosure experiments where we built fences in the middle of the forest and we compared what it 
the impact was of having these high densities of pigs in forests. And what you can see without even showing you a graph is that inside the fences, there's tons of saplings and forest regeneration occurring. And outside the fences, there's not. And it's hard to tell here, but what you do see is these are liana stems that are remaining because lianas are very difficult to pull out for their nest. And so if we looked at, well, then we looked at the forest geo 50 hectare research plot where every single stem was of trees was mapped and measured over a 20 year period. And what we found is in 1986, we had 80,000 more small stems than in uh, 2010. And this is directly tied to the pigs removing small stems for their nest. So we have this cascade from the oil palm to the wild boar to the tree seedlings and saplings. And what we've, and we've also tied that to the differences in abundance of lianas versus trees. So lianas are recruiting much more in the presence of pigs than trees. And we have recently linked this to um, disturbances, these disturbances from, from nesting to negative density dependence and tree diversity. So it turns out that pigs nesting, they choose dense clumps of saplings. These dense clumps of saplings are oftentimes um, underneath a parent tree. And so when pigs are choosing dense sapling clumps to make their nest, they're killing these patches of high density trees. And that actually increases uh, species evenness. We're also building food web models for many different forests in the region now. And uh, we weight these based on their relative abundance and the number of interactions with other species. And so we have um, about 25 to 30 animals that we get good enough data from the camera traps to do this, to build these food webs modeled with. And number six is the number one biggest node, and that's um, wild boar in Sumatra, but it's bearded pig in Borneo. So within these food webs, if bearded pig, sorry, if pigs are the number one most important node, the immediate loss of that due to a wave of African swine fever um, tearing through the region is going to cause huge implications for its competitors and its predators. And the predators is something that's really important because um, like in Sumatra, the tigers are critically endangered and wild boar are the dominant species and thus likely the dominant prey. And they're basically every large cat in the region um, is threatened or endangered. And so the loss of pigs could have very serious repercussions in the food web. So just to summarize this talk, first the cascading effect effects, pigs are dominant vertebrates in Asia. Um, pigs are increasing due to habitat degradation. Pigs are also an important food source for people and they cause the most crop damage. Overabundant pigs is strongly related to um, forest edges and oil palm and other crops. And this reduces tree recruitment but it also causes negative density dependence and increases tree diversity and it facilitates liana. And so when all that happens, you get a shift in the carbon storage of the forest that is predicted. And pigs are the most important node within a food web model, food web, an Asian food web. And this is especially true in degraded areas where their abundances are even higher. And this has huge consequences for critically endangered predators. So our take home messages from this talk, hopefully is first African swine fever could cause multiple extinctions in the near future. So this is very concerning and should be a, um, a conservation priority. They're gonna completely restructure the ecology of Asian forests due to their links between, predator, between the trees and other vertebrates. And it has serious impacts for food security of millions of people in the region. And so with that, I'd like to thank you and really just highlight that this paper was driven by the co-authors. And um, again, point you to my website, Ecological Cas cascades.com for more information about the work we do in my lab. And that is it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Matthew. Really appreciate that. Um, really interesting. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to open this up for questions. And um, it looks like we've got, whoa, they're jumping around. Um, Mark, it looks like you've got your hand up, I think. I'm interpreting that right. Uh, no, that was just an applause, but thanks. Okay. Now that was a, uh, Matthew, that was a great talk. I was uh, really, I really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, that sounds, boy, that sounds like a really tough situation. You've done a lot of great work there, but I, I didn't have a question. Thanks.
Great. Does any, anybody have uh, any questions for Matthew on this? Matthew, I'll throw a question out there. What would you, what would you uh, recommend? So conservation prioritization of this issue is, is, uh, is clear. What, what do you think the, the most critical initial interventions are since you know, we're not vaccinating these, these wild pigs? And um, what, what's, what would you say the, the first step is in, in, in getting some action on this issue? Um, well, I think there are some, my co-authors I think are on the line and they're actually more involved in the, in implementing conservation protocols. Um, but my, and so I encourage them to just unmute and chime in, but I would say number one is, uh, globally coordinated, um, monitor or so for captive breeding and captive populations, making sure that they are sustainable. So we have large enough um, population sizes and making sure that we have bio, strong biosecurity measures at those places. And so what that requires is coordinating among the different zoos and captive um, breeding programs to see how many animals there are in each one of these places, where are they, and keeping track of that information and keeping those animals well protected from any potential sources of African swine fever. Does anyone have any um, follow-ups on that? Um, hi, this is Chris here. Hi, Matthew, good to see you. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, I think one thing that's important to point out, but this is a international reportable disease. So there is a very strong monitoring available um, internationally, of course, but that has its, um, that also has um, some problems with it because countries are reluctant um, maybe to notify that they have African swine fever in a timely manner. Um, because it has instant um, trade implications, and that is, you know, a, a massive economic impacts the moment you report that you have African swine fever. So it's a it's a difficult balance on um, on on how countries and national governments deal with this. There is often a, a great delay between um, acknowledging that you have African swine fever in a country. Thanks, Chris. I was just going, oops. Oh, I just had someone's hand up. I thought now they... In the chat, there's some questions. Yeah, it's um, Chris Netherton here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, it was a lovely talk. Thanks very much. Uh, just a quick question. I mean, how much engagement do you think there is in places like Indonesia where these wild pigs and also in Philippines from the government in trying to protect them? And is there any danger that they get bundled up in into wild boar in you know in quotation marks and um get risk in the risk of being culled as part of a, a policy to try and try control the disease by killing wild animals that would be really an ideal question for matthew linky or um eric majard who are have a better uh finger on the pulse of indonesia and their um and what they're doing so I will say that pigs don't enjoy a great reputation and uh, public um, investment in their in their survival in the region, largely because uh, the majority population from Malaysia down and through Indonesia is Muslim, and so it's just not a priority species for them. Um, that being said, I don't actually have great information about what the government is doing in Indonesia right now, or in the Philippines either, where the, where, which are the two countries that host the most endangered endemic pigs. So um, it's a really important question. And you know, I've always struggled, so previously in my work with Sumatran tigers, I really have always struggled to engage meaningfully with the Indonesian government. And I think that's partly due to my own failings. And also I think that you need to have relationships built over a longer period of time, which is play. So there's a really important role for the NGOs to play here, communicating the science up to the decision makers in the government, because presumably those NGOs build relationships with the government through long periods of time and can communicate this better. And so, um, for example, Matthew Linky is one of the, is the country director for WCS Indonesia. And so hopefully through those connections, 
he's communicating more with um, the Indonesian government? That's a really important question. And I, I wish I had a better answer. Yeah, I mean, I just, thinking about it from the European context, as, as you're probably aware, Belgium and the Czech Republic have successfully eradicated ASF from the territories by boxing in wild populations of wild boar and shooting them out. So of course there's the danger if that lesson is taken into areas where these endangered species are killed, are kept, they could be caught up in a similar sort of policy. No. Chris, since we have you here, are you, am, I, am I right to think that you were working on a vaccine? Involved yes, in that's vaccine? correct. Yes. So um, uh, the paper uh, on, a, on an adenovirus um, vaccine was the one that you mentioned. That's the work we've been doing. Um, so I'm happy to comment on that if you would like me to. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you in terms of licensing the adenovirus work, that probably isn't ready for prime time because the animals got sick. Um, the pigs got sick. So it's not it's not. Um, essentially ready, ready to be commercially commercialized because you wouldn't want a vaccine that um, obviously you want a vaccine that's going to protect the animals completely. I mean, I would, from the wild, again, come back to the wild pigs, I would be a little concerned about the live attenuated viruses that have been trialed because as you rightly pointed out, these are naive species and with the live attenuated viruses, what we've generally found is that if you attenuate the virus too much, you don't get protection. So although the viruses that are being tested are attenuated in pigs. Of course, you can't guarantee that you, you translate that into something like a baby rooster or the pygmy hogs, which have, as you said, have never experienced the disease before. So do you think that as the vaccines are being developed, uh, are progressing a little bit further, that there could be, instead of just testing it on domestic pigs, maybe these priority pig species could be included in trials especially for, let's say, a senescent old male that was not going to be um, contributing to the population in the same way as um, maybe a younger female. So maybe you could try, we could try all these vaccines on the most susceptible species. Is that, has that ever been done or is that in the? I've, I've no idea if anyone's considering, I mean, what, well, of course, one of the problems is that um, a lot of the trials are, done with very healthy pigs. And so, um, and again, whether that translates to um, you know, backyard farms, et cetera, I think remains to be seen. But I guess thinking about it logically, there's, there's two, different, two different ways you can look at this. Of course, in, in, when you're thinking about a farm, you're, and you want to stop the animals getting disease. You want um, a kind of the perfect vaccine. But when you're thinking about whether a species is going to become extinct or not, <laughs> if, I mean, maybe you don't need the perfect vaccine because the, um, you know, the situation is much, much graver if, it, if, it, um, um, if the pigs get sick and so if your wild pigs got sick and survived, then perhaps that's not the end of the world. But um, uh, of course, then, then there's the whole political problem about as um, one of the previous um, guys mentioned that, of course, it's a reportable disease. So if you've got African swine fever, you've got African swine fever um, um, with respect to the OIE, et cetera. So it, it's a complicated situation. Great. In the, um, in the chat, there's a question that says, uh, how will this disease affect other Sioux species in the region? And so um, there's, so for example, all the warty pigs. And the answer is we have no idea. This is a complete research gap at this point. Please correct me if anyone in the audience has some information that I don't have, but um, presumably we have no reason to think that it would not be as deadly as it would be for the current Sioux species, but we have no, there's been no experimental work or, or observational work to my knowledge about how this virus will affect other Seuss species in, this, in, in Asia, but we're fearing the worst. Does anyone else have something to chime in on that? Yeah, I, I, sorry, it's Chris again. Yes, it, I agree with you entirely. I don't think it's ever been tested. I see a hand up right now. Um, I actually can't see the name of the person, but I see a hand up. Yeah, Matthew. Yep. Yes, um, yeah, thanks for your talk. That was, that was really interesting. Um, just, I guess, highlighting another gap in, in what we know and gap in research. Um, 
one of the characteristic of the East, Asia, uh, East European um, epidemics was the ability of white boar to maintain um, endemic cycles of transmission um, through winter. And um, I guess we have no clue at this point if um, wild boar in Southeast Asia can maintain uh, viral transmission in their population. And so this is really important, both from direct impact on these other uh, endemic sweet species, but also for the support that, um, I guess the, the effect of, of control measures that any government would, would decide and potentially the implications for conservation. So, um, I, I, you know, I don't have an answer, but I, I, this is something that I'm really interested in and I guess putting a call out if anyone else is, is interested is trying to understand more about the movement ecology and contact structure between these, um, these populations so that we get a better grasp on their ability to maintain viral transmission. That's a, yeah, that's not really a question, but it's a very important comment. And the, I couldn't agree more. In fact, I have a big question, which is um, how exactly is this virus being maintained, for example, in Eastern Europe over the winter? Um, is it still 100% mortality rate or near that? And the virus is spreading among different subpopulations. And then of course, pigs reproduce so quickly that if it spreads across one different subpopulation, a different population that moves in can reproduce, you know, 10 piglets per female per year or more and replenish this population. And so I'm not 100% clear about whether or not the virus is being able to be sustained by having lower mortality rates or just by population dynamics of having, um, oh, I see a, yeah, Chris, or is that Chris, sorry. Yeah, so, I mean, this is, these are really interesting questions and Mathieu has, um, you know, put a finger on, you know, one of the most important points. When you look at it in Europe, it's actually surprising at the beginning of the ASF um, outbreaks, how little was actually known about, you know, social st structure and movement of, of pigs um, across uh, Europe. So this whole idea about how the virus can be maintained is, is pretty un unknown at the moment. We just don't have enough, you know, our colleagues in Poland have done some very good tracking and there's some, some of the data from the classical swine fever, which is quite useful, of course. But how, how it can be maintained is, is really unclear. And also the spread has not been as, as projected. So that's the other thing, the slow spread um, uh, it's been quite different than what everyone thought would happen originally. So I think there's a lot of work to be done there. And it's all the more difficult, of course, in Southeast Asia, where we know even less about uh, these pig species and the, the behavior of uh, Suscrofa in the, in the um, forest. So I think there's, there's just a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, yeah, we just we just know so little, it's surprising. And then the other thing probably in Europe, which is really essential is just because it's getting so much warmer, we, you know, in some areas we're now seeing three liters of Suscrofa per year. So that really makes a huge difference and survival rates, of course, are much higher. So the densities are extraordinary in, in some parts of Central Europe. Just to follow up on that, Chris, um, one thing that I, I just want to highlight is that the pig social structure of being gregarious where they're not, they're, they have groups that are fissioning and fusioning. And so they're also very social. They reproduce a lot and these reproduction events are very likely to be a trigger for um, a spread. And so if we think about this virus spreading, we can think about it almost spreading like among people in terms of how we are interacting, right? And so it makes it much more, pigs are basically besides humans and bats, some of the worst animals to try to control virus in because they are gregarious, moving huge distances and interacting often. Um, and I had a follow-up question for, for Chris. Is there any evidence that the wild boar in Europe have developed any immunity, natural immunity, or is it still, if a wild boar is con contracts the disease, they have a 95 plus percent chance of mortality? I don't yeah. know. Chris is probably better to answer that one, but we certainly have seropositive 
are live pigs. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think it's it still is that ninety ninety five percent mortality, and as Chris mentioned, if the pigs you do get zero positive pigs, and therefore that you would assume that they're protected. Uh, some FLI did some uh, the Frederick Lofler Institute in Germany did some really nice work in Estonia with the colleagues over there, and this an attenuated virus did appear in wild boar and was they picked it up for about six months to a year and then it just disappeared and i think the hypothesis is that it's the high virulence is what is of the virus is what's maintaining it in the wild boar population because then i mean they're, they're obviously they're dense for wild boar but the populations don't seem to move around as much as everyone thought they might and so there's the thought that if you've got a very high viral load in a pig carcass, freezes over winter, that infectivity may remain, and that could be uh, uh, part of the contributing factor to it maintaining it uh, in the wild bo in the wild boar uh, and maintaining that virulence, which I guess you would hope wouldn't be such an issue in Southeast Asia. But that's spec or practically speculation. I do, I do have one question actually, if I yes. may. I um, I was quite interested about the pig nests um, that you described. Are these essentially the same as seen in Europe, or is there any suggestion that these are more permanent homes, and could there be any vector interactions with the pigs? So obviously, the ticks are well known in Africa, but they're not thought to play a role in Eastern Europe, and I just wondered if there's any anything known about that. Thank you. Chris, this is a great question. So a lot of our work about the impacts of pigs in Asia has focused on their making a birthing nest, but it appears they only use this for less than one week. And it's only during the time of actually giving birth. And so um, the, the size of these disturbances though, I, I should tell you, like if you walk into a forest where there's a bunch of pigs, the understory is just cleared and all the stems are broken off at about six, um, six inches, 10 cm up high, somewhere like that. And it looks like someone just went through the weed whacker in the middle of a primary rainforest and cleared everything at the same height. And many of them re-sprout. Um, so this is a huge disturbance in Asian forests, especially the edges um, where the pigs are even more abundant than they are in the interior forest. And I think that um, pig researchers globally should come together to assess whether or not this is a common disturbance and as pigs are spreading throughout the Americas, especially down into Brazil and, and further, is this something that we need to be aware of um, as a, an unintended consequence of invasive pigs in other regions? Because I grew up in California, we had pigs. I never saw a pig nest. I never heard about a pig nest. I, don't have, I haven't spent much time in Europe, um, but I didn't know that that was a common disturbance there. Um, well, whereas in Asia, it's the number one, it's probably the number one most important disturbance from a pig. So I'll just open that up to the group if anyone has any anything they want to chime in there. Yeah, Matthew, I don't know if you saw Tony's um, comment about implications for that behavior and and uh, and predictive predictive ability in relation to red plus and um, in some of those aspects. But I don't know if you want to address that too while you're on the topic. Yeah. So it looks like what what um, what. Uh, Tony's getting at is that just like habitat degradation brings people and humans into, sorry, people and wildlife into um, closer contact and that increases the chance of zoonotic disease spreading to um, humans, which is what we're seem to be observing. You also get the same situation with wild and domestic pigs. So as you get more degradation, you get wild pigs increasing densities right on the edge where all these people are living. And they're going to be interacting more and more with domestic pigs. And that interaction between wild and domestic pigs is going to have viruses flowing between wild populations and, and, um, and captive populations and that could increase the potential for an outbreak of, any, of, of a new disease as well. And so what, you, what this means is we have a link between habitat degradation and diseases among species other than humans. Um, and so red plus that might suggest reducing habitat degradation, if that leads to a reduction in wild pig densities at edges, which I think is a good thing, um, 
then that could reduce the chance of um, this of having um, outbreaks among pigs and other and other wildlife species that are interacting with domestic species. So there's another. I mean, there's there's work that's been showing that you know habitat degradation also increases leopards at edges, and the leopards are increasing are interacting with dogs, um, where they they predate dogs a lot. But then the dogs have rabies, and the leopards are getting rabies because at the at the edges. So at these edges, you get a lot of interactions um, between a, a virus that's going between domestic and and wild populations, and um, so if, if red plus can reduce degradation and reduce the availability of resources at edges for wild species and reduce those interactions, then I think it could be a good thing. I, just, I don't know if I answered that very well. I just talked through it. Yeah, it's all good points. Um, we're past our allotted time. I don't know if people want to, um, it looks like Chris has a question. So jump on Chris feel free to jump off if you if you need to as I'm sure you will but we'll keep going as long as people have questions uh, well, it was just a question about the nests I mean one of the things because yeah Matthew pointed out how cute the pygmy hogs were the pygmy hogs are really good because they actually build nests daily independent of um, farrowing or um, parturition and they actually use it to get out of the heat and so I think it's one of the coolest things about them they build these nests all the time and they normally use them just that day and then they move on or part of the day so I think that was just a curious fact about those cool pigs. Yeah, so while, while the wild boar use saplings to build their nest, I'm assuming the pygmy hogs use grass. Yeah, they use that um, elephant grass stuff, which, which they call grass. But when you try to walk through the grassland, you realize you're not going anywhere. So it's actually one of the fun facts about pygmy hogs. Very cool, very cool. Well, great. Thanks. Thanks to everybody for joining in all the excellent questions and, and great and great talk by Matthew and, and uh, great paper by the team. Really appreciate you guys taking the time. Um, I was I had mentioned this during our disconnective moment, but um, just to let everybody know the next uh, SCB Emerging Issues in Conservation seminar is on the 24th of February at 1700 GMT. Michael Evans of Defenders of Wildlife will be talking about uh, supporting habitat conservation with automated change detection in Google Earth Engine. So thanks to everybody, appreciate it. And you guys have good mornings, evenings, afternoons, depending on where you are. Thank you, George. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Chris, for chiming in there. Appreciate that. Both courses. OK. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs> Bye.